Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. And um, thanks to the organizers for giving me the chance to speak. It's a really nice conference. Um, I think we're all glad to be here back in person. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about some joint work, sort of work in progress with Julian DeMeo of uh, Paris Sud uh, PISA joint. Um, so yeah, weak approximation for Delpex success is low degree. Just to set up some notation before I get going, uh, I'll always mean a number field when I put capital K. Um, omega of K will be the places of K. And I'm going to be talking a lot about generic fibers and that. So eta of X is the generic point of an irreducible scheme X. Hope that's okay. Also, if anyone's um, in the back room, my desk is free, C18. I mean, <laughs> seems like a waste. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, let me uh, start by making a definition. Okay, so if you ever have any trouble hearing me or seeing what I'm writing, just let me know. Um, so yeah, if you have a K variety X, you say that it satisfies uh, weak and surprise second weak approximation. Let's see if I can fit that in there. The so weak weak approximation is not a typo. It really are two weeks. Uh, if there exists some finite set of places of your number field such that when you take the rational points inside all the places that aren't in S into the local points, this is dense. So it's weak approximation, but you have to throw away some finite set of exceptional places. Um, and so you get weak approximation back if you just take the empty set for your exceptional set of places. Okay, so we've already kind of seen weak approximation in Margarita's talk and the Raman instruction to weak approximation, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I'll be mostly talking about weak, weak approximation. Um, okay, so one, one thing to say off the bat um, is that a smooth rational variety has a weak approximation, hence a weak, weak approximation. Um, so this is, well, I mean, I don't need to say what it is, but it's, it's more or less sort of Chinese remainder theorem that affine N space has weak approximation, and so projective space does as well. It's a birational invariant. So it's, it's satisfied by smooth rational varieties. Um, and I think I'll go over here. So I'm mainly interested Uh, in the case where X is a Del Pezzo surface, so just in case you don't remember or you don't know, it's a smooth projective surface uh, with minus KX, the anti-canonical divisor sample. Um, okay, and so we always have this uh, attached degree so you take the self intersection of this uh, anti canonical or the canonical class. You see the minus just vanishes. Um, and this will be an integer between 1 and 9. Okay, and the idea is that as the degree goes down, the arithmetic gets harder. Um, also, I'll be interested in just the case where we've already got a rational point. is the kind of question I'm interested in is if you have one rational point, do you have lots of rational points? Um, and are they dense in the local points? Okay, so what we know here already, um, as I said, the degree dictates somehow the arithmetic complexity. So if D, the degree is at least five, and again, uh, we've already got a rational point, then uh, X is rational. And I think this is work well, at least in the degree five case of Manning. Um, and so in that case, you definitely have weak, weak approximation. Okay, now if uh, you go down one degree lower into degree four, uh, the brown Manning obstruction is the only one oops, to weak approximation. Okay, in a I think this is uh, Salberger 
and score Bogatov. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. So that uh, comment was that you don't need to assume you have a rational point when uh, D is 5. Um, but for D greater than or equal to 5, I guess there are some situations where you might need to assume you have an initial rational point. But yeah, in the degree 5 case, the assumption is automatic there. Thank you. OK, so yeah, in the degree 4 case, brown manin obstruction is the only one to weak approximation. And this brown manin obstruction is supported at finitely many places. So this is, again, sort of what we saw in, in Margarita's talk. There are certain primes or places that play a role in the obstruction. So if you look away from there, you, you have weak weak approximation, essentially. And um, down to degree 3, we just kind of know weak weak approximation from work of Swinnerton and Dyer uh, on R equivalents on cubic surfaces. So I guess I don't really work a lot with the explicit uh, realizations of these things, but D equals 4 is intersection of two quadrics. D equals 3 is a smooth cubic surface. So, um, OK. So yeah, we're going down, and we're getting kind of less strong properties, I guess. Um, now, if we go down into degrees 1 and 2, we certainly have counterexamples to weak approximation for d equals 1, and that's from Viridi Alvarado. Um, and then degree 2, that's uh, Kresh and Chinkle. I mean, we don't know in these cases if brown manner instruction is the only one, but at least we know that weak approximation doesn't hold. So. Um, yeah, but what can we hope for, I guess, is the question. OK, so right, we, we're looking for something here about how many rational points we have or how they're distributed. Um, so maybe we go even weaker than uh, weak, weak approximation. Don't worry, there's not another weak on top of that. Um, OK, but if we have this result of Collier to Len and uh, Ekdal, which says uh, that weak, weak approximation implies, um, well, what, uh, what uh, Damien will be talking about later, or right, right after me, which is the Hilbert property. So uh, I've, I've left it to him to define what that means. But just briefly, if you've already heard the terminology, it means the set of rational points is knocked in. So it somehow means geometrically there are many. Um, so maybe we could, you know, do we at least know Hilbert property in these cases? Or at least in some of these cases for low degree. Um, okay, so, yeah, we do. Well, so if, if you have low degree, we have Hilbert property. If uh, X has a uh, conic vibration, okay, so... What I mean by that is a uh, flat surjective uh, morphism, uh, let's call it uh, suggestively pi 1 from x down to p1. Um, and all your fibers are isomorphic to plane conics. OK, and. Um, the reason I'm calling it pi 1, um, well, is that pi 1 induces a uh, second conic vibration in, in these cases, in these low degree cases. I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and be a bit more consistent. I'm trying to fit more into this summary. <laughs> OK, yeah, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll try and be a bit bigger. Uh, so yeah, pi 1 induces a. Uh, uh, second conic vibration, pi 2. Um, you can see this in, in Iskowski's work. OK, so you have two conic vibrations. Um, and I think I can just fit in on the last line here what, what kind of briefly goes on, how you can propagate rational points using, using these two things. Um, so if you start off with uh, just a rational point, um, 
on a smooth fiber of uh, pi one, then this fiber, you get this fiber C1, I'm calling them these things because, yeah, I'm gonna be kind of generalizing them later. So this fiber that your um, rational point lies on, well, it's isomorphic over the ground field to P1, so it has many rational points. And uh, you can kind of go again, um, and you can make another fiber product. Uh, so if you take C1, and you project it down with a second conic vibration to P1, and you also use uh, the second conic vibration on X. Um, if you think about what rational points are here, they're sort of, uh, you get many point, uh, fibers of Pi2, each with many rational points. So you already had like a kind of P1's worth, and then in C2, you can start seeing kind of infinitely many fibers, each with like infinitely many rational points, and more or less, um, you, if you have this kind of construction, you get Hilbert property eventually, kind of wiggling some things around. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the situation for, for low degree. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my setup. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, um, right. So yeah, let me now explain how I'm gonna hope to get uh, something stronger than the Hilbert property. Uh, so, this is going to be, uh, sorry. I'm going to use a concept called arithmetic surjectivity. Okay, so let me just uh, define right away what I mean by that. So, if I have a morphism F from X to Y of varieties over my number field K. Well, I'm gonna say it's, um, maybe I'm not gonna fit arithmetically in there. Um, arithmetically subjective. Okay, uh, if, when I look at the uh, image of the local points from X, I'm getting all the local points on Y for uh, all but finitely many places of my number field. Okay, so kind of clear why such a property would be really good to have if you're interested in weak leaf approximation. Uh, so I can say that as a note. Um, if X satisfies weak weak approximation, then Y also does. So really there's like two exceptional sets of places going on here. Okay, so in the definition of arithmetically, uh, arithmetically subjective, there's a kind of one exceptional set where you're not subjective on local points. And then if X has weak weak approximation, there's a kind of another exceptional set where maybe it's not getting this density, but away from both of these, um, if you want to approximate local points on Y, you just go back to X, do the approximation, and then go backwards. So, yeah, it's, it's clear why you'd want this, uh, you'd want a cover of your variety you're interested in, and then a, which has a weak, weak approximation, and then an arithmetically subjective morphism between the two. Um, okay, so this is why we're interested in this property. Uh, now let me just define something completely different. But of course, it will turn out to be related eventually. Um, so if I have a scheme X over K, um, I say that it's split if there exists a geometrically integral open subscheme. So if it has a geometrically integral open subscheme, it's split. Okay, so you might have seen split uh, phrased slightly differently before with geometrically an irreducible component that's geometrically irreducible multiplicity one. Um, this is the definition that I'll use its equivalent. Uh, okay, so arithmetically subjective, clearly we want that. Uh, split, what does that have to do with arithmetically subjective? It's not clear. Um, but of course, 
They're related, as I said. So we have a theorem of Deneff that relates the two. Okay, so again, we've got our morphism f from x to y. Okay. So it's a dominant morphism. of a smooth, proper, uh, yeah, smooth, proper, geometrically integral varieties uh, over k. Yeah, these are k varieties. Um, and let's also assume it's got geometrically integral generic fiber. Okay, uh, further assume so um, this is a kind of terminology I'll, I'll uh, explain in a second. So for every modification f prime from x prime to y prime of f with uh, X prime, that's next, Y prime, uh, smooth, um, such that the generic fibers, so F prime's generic fiber, uh, sorry, and the generic fiber of F, so you've got the isomorphic, so you've got isomorphic generic fibers. Um, so yeah, assume that for every such modification, um, F prime has split uh, fibers over the co-dimension one points of Y, uh, of Y prime, <laughs> then F is arithmetically subjective, which I'll just say AS. Okay, uh, so yeah, if we want to prove uh, a morphism like this is arithmetically subjective, we have this criterion of Deneff uh, on modifications, which I'll now tell you what they are. Uh, so there is some hope for proving something's arithmetically subjective uh, through this theorem. So yeah, let me say what modification means. This is what a modification looks like. Uh, so you've got your x prime, your y prime, and your f prime. And you're going across to your original uh, x, y through these alpha x and alpha y. And here, um, f prime is dominant. So you're still dominant. Um, X prime and Y prime are proper. That's one thing. Um, oh, in geometrically integral. Okay, and uh, finally, these uh, these uh, horizontal arrows are birational morphisms. So you can maybe see why this deserves the name modification. You're not really changing much. I mean, you're kind of staying birational to your varieties. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you're keeping many of the same properties. And in the theorem, we're even keeping the smoothness of the original uh, yeah, varieties as well. So it's a, it deserves the name modification, I guess. Uh, OK, so these are the things that Deneff's theorem concerns. Um, but it's, it looks a bit difficult to check every modification and see if it's got uh, split fibers over the co-dimension one points. So I'm gonna sort of work towards finding a different way of uh, checking that. Okay, uh, so, right. If you take just a normal eta, a co-dimension one point of, of just y, let's say, and you look at the local ring, 
which I'll call R. It's a discrete valuation ring uh, with the fraction fields the same as the function fields of of y. Okay, and and there exists uh, an R scheme. Uh, let's call it kind of it looks a bit like a gamma. I don't know. Uh, let's call it kind of curly y. Um, yeah, with generic fiber, uh, the same as the generic fiber of, of S, and special fiber the exactly this fiber over the co-dimensional one point that we're thinking about in the Neff's theorem. Okay, so we're like linking these two things together. So if you want, there's like a picture of your spec of R. It's got its generic point and then its unique closed point. And you've got just a generic fiber of S here and then the generic fiber, or sorry, the uh, fiber over this co-dimensional one point, you're linking them together in one scheme. Um, and so we, what we want in the Neff's theorem is that the special fiber of this R scheme is split. That's what we're asking, right? Um, yeah, okay. But like, I guess, maybe in Y prime instead of Y, but yeah. Right. Okay, so ultimately, if you if you phrase things in this way, um, it's sufficient for the net to uh, use the Neff's theorem for arithmetic subjectivity that uh, any R scheme with with generic fiber uh, that of uh, S has a split special fiber. Okay. So when you first look at the Neff's theorem, you think it's really hard. How are you going to check all these birational uh, or these modifications? At least we've now converted uh, the condition, but it doesn't look much easier because, I don't know, now you've got all these R schemes with this particular generic fiber, and you want to check they have split special fiber. It doesn't look much easier or anything. Um, but uh, this is where this uh, lemma comes in. So uh, this is the lemma of, uh, yes, any proper R scheme, definitely proper here, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, the, just uh, saying that proper is needed, yeah. Okay, right. So yeah, I mean, how are we going to check this condition still? Well, thankfully, we have this lemma that's got out of. Um, now, if you have a regular, oh, yeah, regular integral proper R scheme. Uh, this splitness of the special fiber that we're interested in uh, it can essentially be checked on the generic fiber. Okay, so I'll possibly say a bit more about what that actually means later, but for now, uh, yeah, the key is like we don't have to consider all these possible different um, R schemes with this generic fiber and think about the special fibers. All these special fibers will be split, provided we can check one condition on the generic fiber, which is essentially just having a, a rational point over a certain extension of our, of our ground field or, yeah. I mean, actually, you have the uh, residue field of the DVR. It's essentially a, a more checkable condition. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we have this lemma, and that, that should help us. I mean, for us, uh, we have such a regular integral proper R scheme. Uh, well, we can we can at least desingularize uh, our model. So we've got this like model of our generic fiber. And uh, yeah, we can we can at least get a regular model. Um, 
Now, I think for certain DVRs, it's slightly more standard than others. I mean, we'll actually only be interested in uh, what we call divisorial DVRs, uh, which I'll, I'll say a bit more about in just a second. Uh, but yeah, some desingularization result says, well, we can we can desingularize our model, and then and then we have this nice condition from this lemma. We just need to check. Uh, yeah, I think possibly. So we'll change the condition. Um, we'll, we'll change the condition that we want. So before we said we'd like uh, any proper R scheme with this generic fiber to have split special fiber. Now instead we'll say we want any uh, sort of model of our generic, any model of something birational to our generic fiber to have split special fiber, because then we can desingularize. Right? Like we desingularize. We've at the expense of kind of birationally changing, or just slightly changing our model, if we ask for something stronger than this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right, so we, yeah, well, okay. Yes. Okay, so we have this lemma, that's good. Uh, right, let, let me say a bit more about the DVRs I'm actually interested in, in working with. Okay, um, so again, we have our K variety. Well, X sign uh, DVR X to uh, this following set of DVRs. Discrete valuation rings, uh, DVRs, R. So they just need to be isomorphic to, uh, yeah, the local ring of, uh, yeah, of co dimension one point of X. Uh, and I'll add in one more condition, such that, uh, yeah, there exists some morphism spec R to X, uh, extending the natural morphism you've already got, uh, spec <coughs> K of X to X. Now, let me say right away, because I feel like this would definitely prompt the question. Um, so, I mean, most of the time, X here is proper, so you're thinking, I need to the criterion of properness. This just exists, this extension exists. But okay, so I should maybe been, maybe I should have added this in the definition. These varieties, not necessarily proper. We don't always have such an extension. But I'm defining this set of DVRs I'm interested in to be the ones where we do have an extension of, of the natural morphism spec KX to, to X. Okay, these are the DVRs we're interested in working with. Okay. Um, and so, now we can define a kind of checkable property that we're going to be working with uh, based on this lemma. Okay, so a proper subjective uh, morphism F. So yeah, I'm switching now uh, my sort of X and Y, because ultimately I'm interested in working with a variety X, so I hope that's not too confusing. So now in this definition, it's Y to X. Uh, okay. Between uh, K varieties as a split reduction yeah, we'll say as split reduction at uh, some R in DVR of X, if uh, for any, okay, again, regular integral uh, proper R scheme with <coughs> generic fiber 
that smooth, one, and irrational to uh, that of x, of uh, f, uh, the special fiber is split. So that's what I was saying just now. Um, we would like to work with, with regular proper integral models, but maybe we don't have that to begin with, so we, we do singularize at the expense of now asking about uh, the generic fiber being smooth and birational to that of, of uh, f. Okay, uh, the special fiber is split. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the question that you would probably ask at this point, or that I asked when I saw this, was um, how does this relate to the splitness of fibers of F? Okay, so this is the thing you can really get your hands on, just like regular fibers of your original morphism. You'd like to just check the splitness of these and then be able to say something about split reduction. Okay, um, and so that's what the next proposition is about. Uh, so again, so I guess uh, let f y to x be as above. Um, okay, yeah. So I assume there exists uh, <coughs> some open subscheme u and y such that when you restrict your uh, f just to this open subscheme, um, this is smooth with split fibers. Uh, then for every uh, CDR, R in the in the kind of belongs to the image of this open subset. So in DVR f of u, which lives inside DVR of x, uh, f has split reduction. Split reduction at r. Okay, so we want to get split reduction for all of these DVRs in DVRx. And the good news is, if we are smooth with split fibers on some u, then we have split reduction of all the DVRs in DVR of the, of the image of this this open set. So that's something, something we can actually kind of get our hands on at this point. <laughs> okay, so I guess this stuff was uh, reasonably complicated, all the relationships between DVRs and so on, so if anyone has any questions at this point. Oh yeah. Uh, well, in practice, these are like uh, sort of the, the reason we're calling them, well, okay, so these are often called divisorial DVRs. They're like the, they're like the generic point of a divisor. So as long as you've got your divisors, then you should have divisorial DVRs, I guess. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't say the question, but the question was, yeah, could this set of DVRs of X be empty? Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, divisorial DVRs, which is essentially what these are, are really, they, they take their name from uh, divisors of your variety, so because I guess as long as you have divisors, you have divisorial DVRs. Okay, uh, right, so I've got one more free board up there. Cool, um, so now I can start trying to sort of design the varieties that I want. So I want some arithmetically subjective covers of, of my Del Pezzo surface, uh, which I'm eventually gonna build through my, uh, so I had this C0, C1, and C2 when I was talking about uh, propagating rational points on X, and we're gonna keep going with that construction. So, uh, yeah, let me define these auxiliary varieties. 
So we begin with uh, C0, C1, C2, as above, uh, with Fn from Cn to X, the, well, I guess the natural map you get. So for C0 and C1, they're just kind of subsets of X. So you can just take the inclusion, and then C2 is this fiber product, so you're just taking the, the sort of induced map to X. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think while I'm here, I'll also, um, yeah, actually, no, I think, I think I'll, I'll go first from here. Okay, so these are, yeah, for, for 0, 1, and 2, this is what we're doing. Um, and then for, for n uh, larger, Find uh, Cn by the following fiber products. Okay, so it's really again just extending what we were doing to make C1. Well, to make C2, I guess it was most apparent what was going on. Okay. And I guess this would be like this. So <clears throat> I was about to say what I is, yeah. Okay, so yeah. You've got your two conic vibrations, pi i. Um, again, this is uh, del plexus surface with, with two conic bundles. So when n is odd, uh, we take uh, i equals one. We take the first conic vibration. And uh, if n's even, we take um, the second conic vibration. So we're kind of switching conic vibration each time. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't really get anything new, I guess. You just kept trying to use the same conic vibration. This is why it's so useful that there's two. Um, so we're sort of flip-flopping there. And then we're taking, uh, yeah, we're just constantly building these new CNs. Uh, OK, so yeah, we're just uh, continuing the process, as I said, from C2. And uh, also, yeah, let's see n prime, the uh, desingularization of Cn. And from that, you would get a corresponding morphism. You have your Fn from uh, Cn to x. If you desingularize and just go through the desingularization, you now have something from Cn prime to x. Um, the only reason I'm doing this is because, as I said earlier, smooth uh, rational varieties have weak approximation. It's easy to work with smooth things, so uh, we're going to desingularize here. Okay. Um, so a note. Well, I guess maybe two notes. Um, well, one thing which will turn out to be useful. Well, which does sound to be useful, uh, is this an, so this is my left uh, vertical arrow from cn to cn minus 1. Uh, it has a natural section. So you can just take the identity on cn minus 1, and you can take fn minus 1 going from, from cn minus 1 to x, and you pop it into this, into this diagram, and you see it kind of um, from the universal property for fiber products, you, you get the natural map from Cn minus 1 to Cn, which turns out to be uh, a section. Um, okay, so this is useful. And another thing, well, a kind of inspiration, I guess, uh, for continuing with this process is that C0 and C1 are, well, smooth and rational. I mean, I'm going to desingularize when I when I go higher, so it's just the rational bit that's really important. Uh, so they satisfy. So you satisfy weak approximation. I mean, the question is, what if we go higher? What kind of properties do these uh, fiber products have? Um, okay. So I'll summarize that in the following proposition. Okay, um, I guess 
maybe you can be a sort of two-parter, one on the properties of CN and one on the properties of this, this FN, this map to X, uh, for every N, uh, CN uh, is a rational, uh, yeah, and also geometric, uh, geometrically integral variety of dimension n. So that's what we know about uh, CN. It's a really nice variety. Um, and then I guess for, for n at least 2, Fn is subjective. Well, maybe, it's a, maybe I'll break this into three parts because these are two different things. But so as soon as we're as soon as we can be subjective, we are because at this point uh, you've got a surface going to x. Uh, before that, we just had a point in the curve. And then when you go to at least n equal at least three, um, the generic fiber of f n is geometrically integral. So we're in the kind of, we're starting to get into the situation we want with the Neff's theorem. We have this uh, geometrically integral generic fiber. So for the rationality, um, it turns out that this section I was mentioning is, is fairly useful. So it kind of ex ends up expressing uh, Cn as a, a protective space bundle or P1 bundle over Cn minus one. So we just use induction. Uh, geometric and these other properties. I mean, you're all just you're just playing with uh, properties of morphisms of fiber products. So nothing too interesting going on, but nevertheless, it tells us we're we're in the right situation. Um, yeah. Okay. And I think from here, uh, I'm going to want to kind of get into uh, kind of three quarters of an hour in the main result. But I think I'll want to clean off a board first. So if anyone has any questions, in the meantime. Okay. Right, so my whole point is that I finally built some candidates for uh, arithmetically subjective covers of my Del Pezzo surface. Uh, they have the right properties. And now I want to want to apply the Neff's theorem, so I need to start looking at uh, split fibers. May as well do both while I'm at it. And again, I guess it's it's worth reiterating that um, we were looking for some concrete condition that we could use to, to get at the Neff's theorem because it applies to all these rational modifications. Um, we ended up and of phrasing everything in terms of split reduction over DVRs. And uh, that's, still, that's still kind of a little bit abstract and less concrete. And we, we found out that if you're smooth with split fibers, you can get split reduction at some associated DVRs. So as I was saying earlier, basically um, going up to that second step in this process of producing these CNs is, is sort of enough to help with property. It, it's, it's not quite really. 
In fact, it might, it might, you might be able to phrase everything in terms of this C3 for the Hilbert property. I haven't really made that precise, but it'll turn out that we just need to go a little bit further uh, if we want this arithmetic subjectivity and thus uh, weak, weak approximation. Okay, so yeah, we can finally get going with the kind of main results. I oh, know I've got inferior chalk. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me just tell you what, <laughs> what I'm actually here to prove. Uh, you might have guessed already. Um, but you probably wouldn't have guessed that there's a couple of conditions um, so I'll tell you what they are. Right, so uh, let's take our Del Pezzo surface. And again, it's low degree. Um, with two conic vibrations. Okay, so yeah, there's like two things that we need to be, well, really one thing we need to be a bit careful about. So assume uh, one, uh, really, well, I'll give the kind of technical condition, I guess. Um, so, I mean, the slightly cautious way of, of putting it is that fibers from distinct vibrations have uh, non-zero intersection product. Really, that's just saying that they're different vibrations. Um, like one's horizontal to the other, but I guess this is one way of phrasing it. Uh, you haven't just got one conic vibration like in disguise. Um, but yeah, this second condition is a bit more essential or a bit more non-trivial, I guess. Um, We'd like it to be that singular fibers from uh, distinct vibrations uh, share no singular points. So, I mean, I can, worth probably drawing a picture. So your singular fibers look like, like this, like um, or two lines of degenerate conic. And if the, the straight, if the uh, kind of bold lines are from one vibration and the dotted lines are from another vibration, we don't want this sort of picture, right? We don't want four lines meeting in a point like this. Um, things go, yeah, they're a bit more tricky there. In fact, this is what we're still kind of working on, uh, maybe showing that what we're doing here won't work if, if we have such a picture, but uh, it should be a rare case. Okay, so if we, if we have these two conditions, Then we get what we want, namely uh, the surface has weak, weak approximation. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's just uh, use, let's just uh, develop some notation for these sort of singular points we don't want to be shared. So I'll just put bad of pi i to mean the singular points on the singular fibers. pi i. Okay, so my condition is that bad of pi 1 intersect bad of pi 2 uh, is empty, okay? Really, and again, they're just like the crossing points of these two lines on my fibers. Okay. So, yeah, it's worth saying one more time. Um, we want split reduction at certain DVRs, and we can get that from uh, smoother split fibers um, on certain open subsets. So we're gonna kind of come at this from two different ways and then put them both together. Okay, uh, so first proposition in that direction. So we're, we're kind of 
or into the good scenario where my CMs are, are very nice, geometrically speaking, they're geometrically integral and rational. Um, we've got a geometrically integral generic fiber. Okay. Now, <clears throat> assume that there exists some non-empty open uh, subset of CN minus one, uh, such that uh, F N minus one when restricted to U is smooth with split fibers. So the condition that guarantees split reduction at certain DVRs. And the question is like, how does this transfer up to uh, F of N in the next step? So we let uh, V be the image of this, uh, this open set inside of X. Um, and there exists uh, another open subset now inside of uh, CN, uh, such that when you restrict FN to now this W, The image you're getting, basically, uh, yeah, where we want to have maybe uh, split fibers and so on. Uh, yeah, this has image the this combination of image and pre-image minus the bad points of pi i. Um, I think this i is the same as the one. Well, I'll just say actually, yeah, maybe I should just say. Uh, again, i equals one if n odd, i equals two if n even. Uh, yeah, and is smooth with split fibers. So there's some relationship between where fn minus one is smooth with split fibers and where fn is smooth with split fibers. Um, and this sort of process of taking image and pre-image, or you kind of maybe think you're going to get more as you do that, and we'll see that in the proof of, of the mean result that you kind of quickly develop smoother split fibers over a very large set of X, a large open set in X. Okay, so that's the sort of transfer property for smoother split fibers. I mean, the key idea in, in the proof is that, um, yeah, being smooth with split fibers. It's, it's a good property with respect to uh, fiber products. I mean, it's sort of this plus a bit more that we actually use. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively nice to transfer upwards through this sort of uh, tower, I guess. Um, and I could probably yeah, fit in the other proposition, this one about the split reduction. So like, this is, yeah, as I've said, we're quickly developing uh, smoother split fibers over a large set of X, subset of X, and let's see what happens with, with the DVRs. Again, let N be at least four, and let uh, R be in DVR of X, such that, Fn minus one. So this map has a uh, split reduction at R. Then so does uh, Fn. Okay, so we're kind of, meanwhile, as this set's getting large and we're getting smoother split fibers and therefore split reduction uh, this way, we're also just accumulating these DVRs as we got the tower where we have split reduction. So uh, kind of putting these two together is what we're gonna do to, to ultimately get split reduction at every DVR we want. And well, okay, actually I probably should have said something again, just like the kind of key idea behind uh, that. Um, this section of uh, AN I mentioned, um, 
uh, it induces a rational map on uh, the generic fibers. of these desynchronizations. Okay, um, and so, as I said earlier, there was this lemma of Skorobogatov that we're using, um, where splitness really only depends on the generic fiber of this uh, R scheme. Uh, it turns out, as I said, as I kind of, yeah, just briefly mentioned, it's having a certain sort of rational point. Um, and here we're using basically Lang Nishimura to, to show, show that this is preserved when we go through this rational map. Uh, but that's the key idea there. So yeah, we're gonna put these two together. Okay, just in the last uh, few minutes. Okay, so basically the, the corollary when you put these two together is that uh, as long as, again, this second assumption in the theorem uh, then when you go up to uh, F5, or more pertinently F5 prime, again, because we're interested in transferring weak approximation and that's satisfied by, by C5 prime. Uh, then we have split reduction uh, at all R in GDRX. Okay, um, and yeah, just a couple more minutes. So let me just kind of sketch the proof of the uh, of the theorem then. Um, okay, so I think uh, we go through here. Yeah, so everything uh, this, this property of geometrically integral generic fibers starts at F three. And that kind of comes about because you look at the bottom map for F3, which is this one, C2 to P1. Um, and you can show this is smooth uh, with geometrically integral fibers over some open um, U inside of P1. And if you put, um, well, okay, so yeah, F3 is then smooth with split fibers over U3, which uh, is defined as, just to take the pre-image of that. Um, I guess I don't even call it U3, but okay, that's fine. Uh, then F4, um, yeah, it's smooth with split fibers over, we're now applying this sort of first proposition, I guess, over U4, um, which is now you take pi two inverse of pi two of U, or of U3 even, uh, minus the bad locus of pi two. But when you're doing this image, pi two on U3, um, this maybe contains, this contains a fiber of pi one, and you're acting on pi two, so you get kind of uh, yeah, you, got, you get everything here, essentially, in the U4, apart from the bad locus. So this is X minus. So this is what I was saying. We quickly get smooth and split fibers uh, over almost everything. Um, and then F5 also smooth and split fibers over U5, um, which is now X minus bad pi 1. And then from there, the disjointness of the bad loci means that if you take any R in DVRX, um, it's going to be uh, a kind of DVR of X minus bad at pi 2 or X minus bad at pi 1. Um, and because we're smooth with split fibers there, we know we have split reduction there. And so I guess I can just say the result now follows. So yeah, you just have to get up to the fifth step and you end up getting uh, split reduction every DVR you want, and then the uh, arithmetic surjectivity. I think that's pretty much um, all I've got time to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I'll leave everything else for questions. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much.
So does anybody have any questions? There is this notion of pseudo-split fibers introduced by Dan Lochren, Alexei Skolobogatov, and Anne Schmitz, I think. Um, is this in any way helpful, or would, would it be helpful to consider pseudo-split fibers instead of split fibers? Yeah, um, it would be helpful to look at pseudo-split fibers uh, in the sense that I was saying earlier, it would be good to know that we're getting all we can out of this method. Um, so do we really need uh, disjointness of these bad loci? Um, and so, yeah, this uh, result of Lochran's Gorbogatov and Smates, um, it says, yeah, there's a kind of converse condition, right? You need pseudo-split fibers for modifications. So we can, again, this is sort of very much work in progress, but it looks like we can maybe show that if you have these intersecting bad loci, then you have a certain modification that fails to have pseudo-split fibers um, over a certain kind of codimensional one point. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of helps. In, in that sense, it helps. Uh, thank you. Uh, any further questions? I have another one, maybe, maybe a naive one. So does your main result give anything new, any new cases for Tsariski density of rational points on the Petzl surfaces of low degree? Uh, no, um, nothing new for uh, Tsariski density because, um, well, because we have this unirrationality result of Collar and Miller. Um, so really we're working with conic bundles with not too many singular fibers. Um, I guess it's at most seven singular fibers and they've already proven uh, unirrationality assuming a rational point. So um, yeah, we, we already have that. We're kind of moving beyond unirrationality, maybe moving beyond density and getting something like a work property or weak approximation. Uh, it would be obviously really great if you could say something like Brown Man instructions, the only one for weak approximation, but maybe in the future. Thank you.